We have two wonderful speakers this evening from the uh, Climate Reality Project, and um, each of them has something to offer in this regard. So I'd like to introduce, first of all, Julie Shapiro. Julie is over here. Uh, she was, when I read her resume, she is into public health all the time, has been. And she has uh, a number of, of places that she worked. She, uh, she worked at, for the Highland Group and Save Savage and Associates as um, a health promoter there. A uh, wow. number of other things too. She got her master's in public health from Northwest um, Ohio Consortium. And that consortium was Lord June, pardon me, not Lord, <laughs> University of Toledo, Bowling Green State University and uh, Medical College. So um, that was a, a degree that is still here. And I guess Dr. Stephen Roberts, so first of all, planned that and uh, fought for it and got that uh, degree uh, approved. And as some of our students I know have been in there too. Julie uh, joined the Climate Reality Training Project in 2018. And that was working with Al Gore and a lot of other people uh, in the Climate Reality Project. So she will talk about that. She's a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby and a, the National Advocacy Group for this, um, organ, or this yeah, organization. Besides that, she's a normal human individual. <laughs> She teaches yoga, that's a passion she has. Uh, she is, uh, she likes hiking and, and uh, all kinds of other outdoor activities. So she's really steeped into the environment of uh, big kinds and all different kinds of ways. Dr. Stephen Roberts is here. He is um, a PhD from the University of Illinois, but his master's and his bachelor's were from Windsor, Ontario. I don't know, are you Canadian? I am. Okay. Well, yeah. well, I'm American also, just so you know. <laughs> He's a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby in Perrysburg, Ohio, chapter 22. He's a member of the Climate Reality Project for Northwest Ohio, chapter 2021 to present. Um, he also um, has taught at the University of Toledo. And he in the Department, you know, of Health and uh, Rehabil Rehabilitation, Department of Health, Public Health and Homeland Security, and Department of Health and Recreation Profession, University of Toledo. <clears throat> so he's really been doing this for a long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, he was an assistant professor in Kent, Ohio, and taught secondary school, God bless him. In, uh, in uh, Ontario, Canada, and has developed a lot of publications that he's um, written and co authored with others. Uh, he also got a couple grants that were supported, and he, um, they, of course, are all in public health from a certain way. Served as a member of GASP, Toledo, a citizen activist, activist group which brought about the clean indoor air in Toledo. Hmm. The legislation was um, one that he proposed and what he said, it says here, he made an intense effort. We know how that is. <laughs> if you're going to do anything new, you know what you have to do. He was uh, heavily involved in a consortium to develop and offer the Master of Public Health degree program that I'm sure also <laughs> required some some um, negotiating. So with all of that, we're happy to have both of them here this evening to talk about the Climate Reality Project and uh, whatever else they have to talk about. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, we're gonna move up to all that. So can you hear me? <laughs> okay, if I wander off, my voice can get quiet, just raise your hand and I'll talk a little louder. The audiologist told my husband my voice is in that range you can't hear at all. <laughs> yeah. So good evening, and I have to admit, I had not heard of the SAVE organization until this year when our fellow committee member crossed paths with Sister Rosine, 
And I know I speak for our whole chapter when I say that we commend you for your long-term commitment to this very important mission of linking ecology, spirituality, sustainability, and your climate action as well. So we have a couple of other committee members here, Dennis and Tony, if you want to just raise your hand, you can put a, a face to our committee. Thank you. Julie, is this too much dark? Nope. I like it dark. You can see the slides better, I think. We have some really impactful, we believe, slides. So we thank you, Stephen. I thank you for this opportunity to share our presentation on climate change. What we think is, without a doubt, the most important the most urgent and potentially irreversible threat to human societies. So our presentation is in two parts. Unfortunately, I have the doom and gloom part, which is, I guess what I call, if you will, the state of the planet address, and a little bit of how we ended up here. Steve has a more uplifting part, which is existing solutions as well as developing solutions and actions that can be taken. For if we thought this was hopeless, we would not be here tonight. Mm -hmm. And last, I'm reminded what Catherine Tejo, anyone familiar with Catherine Tejo? She's an author, she's an evangelical Christian climate scientist, wonderful author. <coughs> And she often says one of the most important actions we can take as individuals is to talk about this problem. Talk about it with your family, with your friends, with your neighbors, and importantly, talk about it with your politicians. So we hope that after this evening, you'll continue, you're probably already talking about it, but you'll continue the conversation because I think anyone who's living on this planet knows we want a better future. All right, so let's dig in. We have access to about almost 600 slides. So it's always difficult to choose the ones that we would like to share at any given time. So we try to choose the best. We hope that you will find them in Canada. So let's begin. So some of you probably know this image. It's called the Blue Marble, and it was taken out the window of Apollo 17 in 1972, but it was really quite an image at the time. And it, I would say, launched the environmental movement when people really saw the planet from so far away. So the state of the planet. For many years, the majority of climate scientists have agreed we need to stop the warming by two degrees Celsius, better yet 1.5 degrees in pre-industrial times. We've already warmed 1.1 degree, and of course, it's not even across the globe, so it's worse in some areas. So just reviewing our very basic science, but how did we end up here? Well. We know we get energy in the form of light waves, passes through the atmosphere, and we have a very thin shell, actually, of atmosphere. It looks so vast if you're laying on the grass looking up, but it's actually quite thin. And that energy is radiated, some of it, back into space in the form of infrared rays. And some of this infrared is trapped by the atmosphere, the natural greenhouse gas layer, and it's kept our planet pretty consistent in temperature for a long time, make, making it habitable. However, as CO2 increases, it's like we laid a big heavy blanket around the planet. So where is this pollution coming from? Well, first of all, the amount that we're spewing into the atmosphere is over 160 million tons every day, as if our atmosphere is an open sewer. Where is it coming from? Well, lots of different sources. Transportation, we have deforestation, we know we have a lot of melting. However, hands down, the largest source is from burning 
fossil fuels. And if you look, and I wonder, John, well, sometimes I pull that whole string of people to the left because it's going to block a lot of Can I do it here? We can move them around. But it, it's an important chart because if you notice, World War II is somewhere around here, what happened after World War II. But you see the little blip at 2020. You remember we had a little thing called COVID and emissions actually started to drop. But as we got ramped up and things became somewhat back to normal, emissions increased again. So the result of that, of course, is our surface temperature has increased. And look at what's happened in the last 20 years. 20 of the 21 hottest years on record have occurred since 2002, and the last eight have been the hottest. We continue to see records broken, one right after the other. I'm sure you read about it, you hear about it. I might have to move these people back to the right. But I included this slide because at the top, you'll notice a little town called Blighton, Canada, and they broke their all-time record in 2021, and the next day the town burned to the ground. Um, so it's quite dramatic. If we look here at records that have been broken, the darkest maroon are all-time heat records. And look at the west of our own country. How many records? Not a record we want to hold, but the impact is people died from the heat. This was Spain. Over 300 people died last summer. And I put this slide in because it's important to talk about environmental justice. The most vulnerable people are hit the hardest by climate change. And can you imagine living in a favela in Brazil with 100 degree heat, of course, no air conditioning, not much tree cover, can we see? So we've read quite a bit about Pakistan as of late. They've had terrible flooding this year. Pakistan, Bangladesh, India have really been hit hard by climate change. But for every degree Celsius, every rise in that temperature, the stillbirths and premature deliveries actually increases. And imagine if you had to work outside in those conditions in that heat. So let's pan out for a moment looking at the Pacific side of the globe and just reminding ourselves that 70% of the globe is ocean. Majority of our planet is water. And unfortunately, the heat is actually trapped in the oceans and it doesn't stay in the ocean. It comes back to land to have many effects. As well, it's affecting our oceans by killing our coral, we know the Great Barrier Reef is in trouble, and about a billion people count on that area, not only for work, but for their food. The great movie called Chasing Coral, if you haven't seen it, it's fascinating. So again, one of these charts, the last 20 years, the same in the oceans, temperatures going up, and the warmer temperatures are going deeper and deeper. The reason that we're seeing more of these storms is because the oceans are warmer. And what happens is it supercharges these storms. So two things happen. When the water is warmer, the storms slow down, so they last longer, and it's like they're on steroids. They're more intense. So this happened to be one hurricane that hit in Mexico. And sometimes you don't get the hurricane, but you might get the aftermath, like, Miami got 11 inches after this particular hurricane. I've stopped trying to remember the name of the hurricanes because there's just too many. And of course, we saw a horrible one in Florida recently. And it's the same all over the planet. This is India. This particular storm, over a million people had to be evacuated. So 
So again, we talk about environmental justice. To poor communities on the coast, more people die from these storms. They are not able to adapt <coughs> and mitigate as we are in this country and not always in this country. So for a long time, the Pope has been talking about climate change. Could be familiar with that. In 2015, he made the statement that the poorest people suffer the most from the effects. And if you haven't seen his TED talk from 2020, it's really good. And he talks about how it's our responsibility to take action. So if you haven't seen that, it's worth looking up. So the second thing that happens, the storms are worse, and now we also have more evaporation of moisture. And with more evaporation, we have more precipitation events, bigger rain events. And again, one of these charts, the last 20 years, you can see what's happening with record-breaking anomalies. And we've come up with a new vocabulary now. This is called a rain bomb, and we're seeing these all over, and it's just an extraordinary amount of water that comes down quickly. It's kind of beautiful, but frightening at the same time. <laughs> and of course, the land can't handle that amount of water that fast. This is in China. This is really a profound before and after. If you think of Germany, such a developed country, beautiful day, all of a sudden, rain bomb, after effects. Oh, wow. Brazil, just this past May. Our last training that Al Gore had was in Brazil. So I could have brought you about 200 slides from Brazil. But they've had a lot of problems there, of course, with the Amazon and the deforestation. This is South Africa. They had their biggest storm this past April, and they get mudslides. So if we call it a hurricane or a typhoon or a cyclone, they're all caused by water. This was right here in Tennessee in 2021. We've stopped talking about one in 1,000 year storms. It used to be an extraordinary thing, but now we've seen 26 in the last 12 years. Hmm. So on the flip side, some areas we have too much water. Oops, that went too fast. So go backwards. The same heat, I guess I can't go back, but the same heat is causing drought. And we're seeing pockets of drought, more than pockets, all over the world, so, and right here at home. So three states in our own West, Nevada, Utah, and New Mexico, are in 100% drought. And that darkest red, again, is where it's extreme. And that tends to be one of our challenges in Northwest Ohio. We don't really have yet the effects of climate change as if we lived in California or if we lived on the coast, Florida. It's a little bit slower here, but these people in the West, they are experiencing, experiencing it. Um, Southwest, the last two decades have been the driest in the last 1,200 years. You've probably been reading about Lake Mead. They've found quite a few bodies of unearthed that they apparently thought would never come to light. And looks like someone just put a straw in there and drained it, doesn't it? This is Mexico. I've actually been to that area of Mexico. They're on a limited water consumption now, three hours a day because their reservoirs are going dry. Water scarcity affects 40% of our globe's population. And I can't help but think here we are sitting on the greatest freshwater lakes in the country, and I don't think we're treating them too well. Hence, algae blooms, etc. So we need to be vocal about that. And as well, climate change is affecting food supplies and decreasing harvest and causing a lot of climate migration. It's already happening. You know, there's a direct correlation between hotter years and more fires. Makes sense, right? It's drier. 
You can just see how it correlates perfectly in this chart. This was New Mexico last May. They had the three largest fires on history going on all at the same time in different parts of the state. Hundreds of thousands of acres were burned. And of course, every time there's a fire, there's a hurricane, there's a huge economic impact. And we've seen that just grow exponentially. California, as I said, has really been hit hard. Six of the seven largest fires in their history have occurred since August of 2020. I think we're seeing migration out of California. And it's all over the world. We've had fires in Spain, Greece, Korea. So another one of those charts, where we just look at the extreme weather catastrophes and just on the increase. <coughs> So let's go to the poles for a moment. If we go north to Greenland, this photo was taken in 1935. Really look between the ridges. And this was 2013. It's now a lake. The decrease in ice mass is happening so fast. This to me is mind boggling. They're measuring it in gigatons. I'm not even sure how to get my arms around a gigaton, but I think it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and the ice sheets are melting faster than predicted as well. If we go to the other pole and we go south, Antarctic has the same problem. Here, they measured it in metric tons. And of course, the effect of this is sea level rise. And we're seeing that. Now, if we look at the top... 10 cities at risk by population. <laughs> Most of them are in Asia. But if we look at the top 10 cities from sea level rise by assets, all of a sudden the United States has two in the top three. Miami's number one, and yet they continue to build high rise after high rise on this game day. It's mind boggling to me. And New York is number three. And here's Miami. It's for guy lost his habitat in the, <laughs> the wrong turn. But this is not funny. We're seeing it all over the globe, and they just call it sunny day flooding. This isn't a rainstorm. It's just a regular day, and sea level rises. I put this slide of Norfolk in there because Norfolk has the largest naval base in the country, and they're in trouble from sea level rise. And there's a whole lot of money tied up in that base. We're seeing a lot of high tide flooding in this area. We now have countries that are being relocated because they're going underwater. And I heard a lot of conversation at the meeting in Egypt, probably did too, a couple of weeks ago. There were some countries asking for reparation dollars because they're saying, we have not contributed to the problem, but we're suffering all the consequences. Stay tuned to see what happens. The Department of Defense in 2014 made the statement that climate change will lead to food and water shortages. That's already happened. Pandemic disease, that might sound familiar. And disputes over refugees and resources. And really a lot of the migration we're seeing is, seeing is exacerbated by climate change, no doubt. So this is current areas of the planet that are uninhabitable because it's just too hot to live there. If we don't turn this train around, we're going to see all the areas with stripes. That's a prediction. Uninhabitable. What breaks my heart is seeing the rainforest. Can you imagine? Hopefully the president-elect is giving us a good conversation or he's going to fight for the rainforest, so let's hope that's true. We've always called it the lungs of the planet, right? So again, migration and environmental justice. Many people have been displaced. When we think about farming, we know the heat is devastating to crops and harvests and declining um, 
you know, production. Again, you can't feed your family and you don't have water. You've got to leave where you're living. And then air pollution, that's another issue. We just saw a movie called The Human Element. Maybe some of you have seen it and they showed some schools in this country where children with asthma have to go because they have to use their nebulizer three and four times a day. Well, that's sad. And I, I have to say, we don't see many oil and gas production facilities being built in Ottawa Hills, right? Poor black and brown people are definitely affected by air pollution, that's a fact. This was Brazil, 2020, 84,000 people died from pollution. So as we move into wild places looking for new habitat, we're also unleashing new infectious diseases. And this map kind of shows, you know, it used to be these diseases were more concentrated, but they're expanding into areas where we have not seen them before. And you can see in the United States as well. So we have to change. Biologists, scientists tell us we're looking at extinction if we don't. So that's pretty good motivation <laughs> to change. We're at risk of losing 50% of our land-based species. So that's the case I make for change. I warned you it was a little doom and gloom. <laughs> And I'm happy to turn it over to Steve for a little bit more uh, optimistic. And of course, I. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but it's the laundry list. <laughs> All right. Cheer him up. <laughs> I'll be right. So we, all, we obviously didn't choose the parts of the present to make based Steve, on our first Speak right into the microphone. Yeah, we obviously didn't choose which part of the presentation would be made based on our first analysis. Uh, <laughs> if she got to do the gloom, I get the happy stuff. <laughs> um, one thing to clear up uh, in, the, in the introductions, just for actors, now, I did not on my own do the clean indoor air stuff. It was called Gas Toledo. It was a lot of people, including Julie, by the way. Uh, and that was uh, passing legislation to stop smoking in bars and restaurants. We did that in the early 2000s. So it wasn't just me. Humans respond, okay? So we have this nightmare situation, at least that's the way I'm looking at it. Um, and but being positive, no, no other way. Uh, humans respond, so we're, we're trying to work to do things to counter it. It's oftentimes the corporations and the public that are responding better than in the government. Uh, for instance, in, we have four or five cities that are moving quickly, or not moving quickly, moving steadily to cope with the changes that are coming. Toledo uh, is not one of them. Uh, they're dragging their feet, and uh, we're trying to encourage them to move a bit quicker. So, but we are responding. We have solutions. We have what we need to deal with the problem. It's just, it's a matter of implementing it. And that's where the political will comes in. <clears throat> so if we can get to net zero, the temperatures will stop going up. And after all, the temperatures going up is what's driving this. Oh. Reminds me of another thing I like to say. Way back at the start of the Jewish presentation, there's a slide on fossil fuel uh, emissions going up. I hear people still saying, well, the climate changes, it's always changed. What's the big deal? As though there isn't a constant movement towards higher temperatures. That slide is an excellent way to talk about it because the uh, increase in uh, greenhouse gases started with the uh, Industrial Revolution. And 150 years ago, we knew that CO2 was trapping heat. And if you notice uh, the upward movement of 
carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, it goes along with the increase in temperatures. It's hard to believe that's a random event. It's hard to believe it's just happening. Humans are, after all, producing the greenhouse gases. You know, the other critters on the planet are not doing that. It's us that's, that are doing it. Okay, here is how the progress we're making, and it's really quite remarkable. It's probably not fast enough, but it's quite remarkable. Um, the 2000 projection, worldwide wind capacity will reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. By the way, a gigawatt will power 750,000 homes. That's how you can think about a gigawatt. Reality, that goal was exceeded by a factor of 20. <laughs> Uh, U.S. wind energy is increasing greatly, not so much in Ohio. Ohio doesn't like wind very much. Uh, there's so much wind in Texas, they now have free electricity at night. Mm -hmm. So it's working. Wind is very, very solid in Texas. Wind could supply worldwide electricity consumption 40 times over. So that's the technology that we have that's available. It's a matter of using it. Solar energy progress, sort of the same thing. That was the projection early on. Ah. And then this. And of course, we have the biggest solar panel manufacturer outside of China sitting a couple of miles from us. And here's U.S. solar capacity in gigawatts. And you see it's constantly increasing. And to go along with that, it's getting so much cheaper. Back in 1976, it cost $79 to produce a watt. Now it costs 22 cents. Now this is the remarkable thing to me about human beings. What we can do. This is amazing to me. We can't get along with each other. But we can do this stuff. <laughs> it's, it's just totally mindful. You know, that, yeah. New electricity is uh, from solar and wind in the United States. So we're, we're moving ahead. We're not moving ahead enough, but we're moving ahead greatly. Here's China and their problem. 25 gigawatts so they're doing a lot, but look what others are also doing. Here's their new capacity in China. And you can see there's a lot of solar and wind, but there's also that coal. They have so many people that have to be supplied with energy that they still have to be there with coal. Um, but 58% of their new capacity was from solar. I believe they have more solar than we do. They are really working hard at that point, but they have the other part. Same with India. Mm -hmm. A lot of solar. So people complain about China, and I get the complaints, but they're also trying hard with alternatives, but they're still, they're still in the cold way. Now, here's another one of Julie's favorite slides. <laughs> this is the Chilean solar market. You're not going to forget this. <laughs> if you want to see solar panels, go to Chile. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're doing well with solar. All right. Now, this is the beauty of alternatives when it comes to providing uh, countries with less assets with electricity. It used with, when we did it, we had to have poles and cables and all that. All they need to do there is put a solar panel on their roof, get a cord, and they got their laptop going. They don't have to do anything else. What a great thing. So, uh, you can spread electric power in places that don't have anything very easily with solar panels. <coughs> Let's 
So it does a lot for people that don't have much power because you can install solar fairly easily. Now, Australians are moving far ahead. One in three houses. Open. Now, they're a wonderful place for sun, obviously. They are having huge uh, environmental problems now as well. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother lives in Melbourne, and uh, it's pretty rocky for them somehow. This is amusing. Kentucky Coal Mining Museum. They have <laughs> solar panels on the roof. Because <laughs> they save eight to ten thousand dollars a year in energy costs. Wow. The, last one <laughs> <laughs> the coal museum with solar panels on the roof. All right. And here's where, you know, here's where all we have all the energy we need sitting right there. Right? We just need to, to move. To move fast with uh, setting up the equipment. Now, one of the issues with alternatives, and I hear this all the time with my friends, yeah, but when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, you don't have any energy. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> um, well, it's called storage. <laughs> and we're having a hard time keeping up with storage, but we're getting better at it. And this is the uh, Mm. predicted storage uh, in gigawatts uh, in the future. So there's a lot of jobs in alternative energy. Now there's some question as to whether those jobs pay as much as other jobs. I don't know. Does anybody know? It's a question I have. Do alternative energy jobs pay as much as uh, other jobs? Like if, mm -hmm. if you're a coal miner, what do you make? And what do you make if you're a wind turbine person? Mm -hmm. Anybody know? Okay. I should know that. I don't. Sorry. Well, if you factor in the uh, the cost of health care for coal miners, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, no it's, doubt solar yeah. wins hands down. Oh, as far as ex as far as the expensive living? Uh, yeah, living. Okay. You know, because coal miners wind up with black lung disease right. and all those kinds of things. No, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so if you, if you look at the big picture okay. rather than uh, the, long the hourly. Yeah, yeah. You know, it doesn't matter the hourly, you know, in the long run. That's right. Can, what okay. value can you place at uh, the right. cost of somebody's life in a short twenty years? Yeah, exactly. Very good. Thank you. I never thought about that. So there are a lot of jobs when it comes to oh goodness. there is one difference in the um, communities and the income of coal and in new technologies of solar and wind, that in solar and wind, you have technical positions whose expertise takes a few years to learn and that the scale, the income scale, um, slides much more than the more um, continuous lower income of the coal. So what you have in the tech industry is those who can climb to the top of the turbine and do the technical work have much greater in income but the person who's carrying the solar panels up to the roof make as much as a roofer does. Okay. So you have that range of income in the solar and wind. All right. All right. And in coal, you have more of a flat to line income. All right. Thanks for that. Thank you. Worldwide, carbon free sources generated more electricity than coal in 2020. Um, well, coal-fired power plants are on the way out. Um, I wonder about the coordination and hoping that we don't get rid of something before we have enough alternative to supply us. So I'm sure somebody's smart enough to figure that out. Corporations are responding. Corporations, it's a happy thing that corporations are really responding to the situation because they see the reality they also see the problems that climate change is going to cause that. And many of them also see the profit in making the transition from fossil to alternative. So they're jumping in, a lot of them anyway. Uh, over 370 global <coughs> companies have made a commitment to go 100% renewable. Here's some of them. <coughs> GM, 
It's going to phase out gasoline and diesel powered passenger vehicles by 2035. Uh, GM secures enough renewable energy to power the US facilities by 2025. So they're going to be all uh, renewable. Interesting that part of their renewable is going to come from wind farms in Indiana and Ohio. <laughs> so the politicians in Ohio don't like wind. But this corporation is glad that how some, some Ohio people have wind available. Electric vehicles will reach price parity. Because right now, the uh, electric car companies are selling the more expensive cars. They could sell cheaper ones with batteries that didn't get you so you could go 350 miles. Because most people only drive 70 days, 70 miles a day, which would, would require a smaller battery, which would be a less expensive car, they're selling the more expensive ones because they're, people are buying them. So it's getting to the point where they're gonna offer a cheaper electric car. So uh, electric cars going up. Well, here's some things that corporations are doing. Uh, this company, Carbon Engineering, captures uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and uh, keeps it. Now, you can, carbon dioxide is good. It makes a metal as strong as steel, carbon fibers. It's uh, good for fertilizer. It's good for animal feed. It's also good for making lightweight metal that can be used in uh, wind turbines and uh, airliners, airplanes. Hmm. So carbon capture. So we're taking something out of the air that we light out of there, and this company is making stuff out of it that is profitable. What's the name of the company here? Carbon. Um, I don't know. I couldn't. Carbon engineering. Carbon engineering. Yep. yep. Making steel. Making steel traditionally has been very dirty and has created a lot of. Uh, gas is going in the atmosphere, uh, we've come up with a different way to use it, to make it. It used to be by using coal to remove oxygen from the iron ore. So part of the process of making steel is getting the iron ore out of it, or removing oxygen from the iron ore, sorry. So what they've done is they're replacing this coal, this coking coal with hydrogen. And if you use a, a clean hydrogen, then you can make steel without producing any uh, greenhouse gases. So hydrogen's the answer to making steel without producing greenhouse gases. The issue with hydrogen though is you can have dirty hydrogen or clean hydrogen. So in order for this to work, you have to have clean hydrogen. Concrete, so concrete is a big producer of CO2. And we're using so much concrete. As the population increases, we keep using more and more concrete and it produces a lot of CO2. Well, there's a process where you inject CO2 into concrete. It makes the concrete stronger when you do that and you don't have to use as much concrete. So there's sort of a win-win here. We get some of that CO2 out of the air we don't put as much into the air and we make the concrete uh, stronger so you don't have to use as much of it. Very, very innovative. I mean, this is great ideas. And here's one that is uh, kind of strange looking, but this is a boat that carries a lot of cars across the ocean using mechanical sails. And it saved 90% of the fossil in getting across the ocean. It's slower. It takes twice as long to get across the ocean this way as opposed to fossil uh, engines, but it saves a lot of greenhouse gases. Now we have planes that uh, just have batteries. Uh, there, it was uh, developed by an Israeli company. They have a range of about 300 miles right now. And they can carry something like seven passengers with their luggage for 300, I think it's 300 miles. They can't get across the ocean because the battery would be too big 
and too heavy to make its way across. So that's not, we don't have that here. Limitation. Now this one is great. This one, you keep hearing, again, my, my friends who like to criticize all the movements towards doing something about this problem. They say, well, look at the lithium. You're, you're running out of lithium, it costs too much money and very toxic. Well, the geniuses at MIT have figured out you don't have to make batteries with just lithium and nickel and cobalt. You can make it with aluminum and sulfur. You can make a, a big energy battery with aluminum and sulfur. It's much more accessible. It doesn't require as much money. So another answer to a problem. Uh, electric cars don't have to be made out of these. I'm sure there's toxic things in electric cars. But the lithium battery problem can go away by moving over to these other substances. This was just for fun. You can generate energy by having a dance floor in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> now this, I didn't know anything about this. These are underwater turbines. And they're in the tide, right? Every day, these turbines get turned or turned because they're on the ocean floor. They have to be much sturdier because they're dealing with ocean current, but they generate electricity. Other thing that's going on is a city have action plans. So uh, many cities have sustainability directors and they are planning to cope with what's coming down the line to make us more ready for inevitable increases in temperature and so on. Uh, these are countries in action doing things. 74% uh, of global emissions are from <coughs> countries that have set a net zero target. So these are governments promising us that they're going to do something. Now, obviously, you know, they may, they may not all get all the way there, but at least they're saying out loud, this is what they're aiming at. That's a good sign. And we have trees. Uh, trees are a good way to get uh, to cope with uh, carbon dioxide. Now these slides to me, these three slides coming up, uh, they're about kids. <laughs> and that's who I think about, right? Um, I'll be I'll be out of this off of this planet shortly. Well, hopefully not no. next few weeks. <laughs> but let's face it, I'm past halfway. Okay. So I don't think I'm going to be too bothered by climate unless I get by a hellacious storm somewhere. But my granddaughter, who's 13 now, her life's going to be affected. And she didn't do anything. I mean, she hasn't produced a lot of carbon dioxide. She's just a kid who plays soccer and is good at school. She didn't do anything, and she's going to be subjected to um, the climate change. So that's who I think about. So. I love the poster on the left, climate change is real. In other news, water is wet. Like, no <laughs> kidding, climate change is real, right? But the one in the middle there, it's, it's not set up right on the slide. The kid with the big smile, it says, you will die of old age, I will die of. And on the bottom of that, it says, of climate change. So she says to herself, Matt, look how young she is. She says, I'm not going to die of old age. I'm going to die of climate change. That's what she's carrying around with her. That's what she believes. Come on. Okay. The climate is changing. Why aren't we? So, India. So, Greta. Um, we all know Greta. Amazing kid. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been talking about what other people have been doing with uh, climate. Let me give you a few things, and my, hopefully my compatriots will help me if I don't get them all. These are some of the things that we've been doing in our two groups, Citizens Climate Lobby and Climate Reality Project. One thing is we've been trying to encourage politicians to pass legislation. So there's this uh, legislation called Carbon Fee and Dividend, which I'll share with you in just a minute, a couple minutes. And we've been to visit with uh, Senator Foreman, uh, 
uh, Representative Ladder, Representative Captor, trying to get their support uh, for this carbon fee and dividend legislation. We've had no luck so far. Uh, I'm not sure J.D. Vance is going to want to hear from us. <coughs> That's one thing we've done. We've also worked with City Council, uh, Toledo City Council. They passed a resolution in favor of carbon fee and dividend legislation. They passed a resolution. So they looked at it and they said, yeah, that's a good idea. And they passed that, but that was it. They just recently set aside, or said they were going to set aside 1% of the budget for sustainability and climate programs in the city. Now they had a press conference earlier in the summer when they said they would do that. They said also they were gonna have a citizens community to, uh, committee to determine what projects would be funded. Well, they haven't, they haven't had, they don't have the committee yet. They don't have, so that has not gotten off the road. The last thing they did was have a press conference. We've also been in parades. We've been in parades to promote the uh, legislation. Those were fun. Uh, we've shown movies. Uh, we had one uh, in Maumee, and we had one just down at the Imagination Station at uh, uh, Human Element Film, which was just there a few days ago. Uh, we've written letters to the editor. We've written a lot of books. Um, we have public presentations. What else do we do? I think Tabling. Tabling. Tabling, a lot of tabling. tabling. Yeah, it, exploring options for uh, right. getting Toledo to be a, uh, a city that can be really ready for climate change by changing kind of like how our city is organized and built. And, right. You know, right. That's the big I mean, thing. Yeah, We're trying. We're trying. We're trying. We're trying to make that happen. Um, and quite, right. <clears throat> quite uh, seriously, actually. Uh, did you want to say anything about that, then? There is no master plan in Toledo for managing carbon dioxide. University of Toledo has an excellent assessment of how much carbon is used on campus. It has not been updated lately. And um, many communities are looking at carbon as the basis by which they make the rest of the city plan. Holland, Ohio, Holland, Michigan is one, and Windsor, Canada is one. And there's a few other towns in, uh, um, in Ontario that have taken carbon as its fundamental goal, zero carbon, and having the economic benefit of not losing your monies to a carbon producing company. In other words, generate your own electrical power and you don't have to buy it out of Kentucky or across uh, Wyoming. In other words, when we use electricity this way, we're actually losing Toledo dollars to Wyoming or Southern or, or the Appalachian because that's, well, and if it's oil that we're using for our cars for gasoline, we're exporting our dollars to Texas and to the crude refineries instead of the money staying in our communities. So that's that's a future plan, but it's so the alternatives we keep it in the community. Yeah, right. right. And, and we've looked, looked, looked very carefully at um, introducing that plan for Toledo. It takes right. it's a ten year plan, but oh. it uh, is quite detailed. So that's that's the frontier. That's right. a frontier. Right. Okay. Anything else? Jill? I think you covered it. Covered. Now, what can we do as individuals? <clears throat> so here are some suggestions. Uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, compost, eat less meat, buy sustainable. You can read, I guess. Uh, change your lighting, go solar, <coughs> plug in car, walk more. <coughs> so we can do all these things. One of the most important things you can do, though, is communicate with politicians. We have, we have to get the attention of legal politicians. We're Toledo area politicians. Uh, what's different about Maumee, Julia? Their leadership. Okay, but 
Do you want to talk about that for a second, what's going on there? Or not? Well, they they have a new, what is Patrick's role? Did she, yeah, talk to my um, They have a new city planner in Maumee that is really innovative and doing a lot of, um, more of a plan than Toledo, actually. And you'll see now, like the Myers on Reynolds, they redid that to put trees in, they're requiring tree cover, and just starting to, like the towpath, they took out all the invasive species and they planted all native. So they're trying, every time they have to spend dollars to consider this. So it just needs to be a part of everything they do. And I think they're doing a better job than Toledo is. I promise to never put you on the spot again. <laughs> All right, here's the legislation I was talking about. Um, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. This bill, and this is a bill that so many experts and economists think is a huge part of the answer to dealing with fossil fuel. The bill imposes a fee on carbon content of fuels. So it makes people pay more for that. It puts a, puts a fee on it. Then it immediately takes that money and gives it to the American public, American family. And uh, it creates jobs, saves lives, decreases greenhouse gases, and stimulates the economy. It looks questionable, but people have investigated this and said this would do a great job. Because by raising the cost of fuels and helping, pay, helping people pay for that increased cost, you are decreasing the use of fossil fuels. Okay, here's a little bit about the Climate Reality Project. Started by Al Gore. Um, the voice of reality, <clears throat> talking about climate, like we're doing right now. We're doing our best to try to have an impact. Okay. <laughs> yep. Questions? What are the obstacles to Ohio and local politicians uh, seeing the reality? Um, I think there's a lot of vested interest, and I think um, businesses give money to politicians. I think it comes down to that. There's a lot of vested interest in keeping things just the way they are because a lot of people are successful in shooting with things just the way they are. What we're going to have is we're going to have a big shift and some people are not going to do as well after the big shift as they are right now. So they're trying to protect that. That's the way I see it. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Yep. I have a response to that. Yep. We are sitting at the oil refinery capital here in Toledo. The very first oil well that was ever found was here in Oregon, Ohio. Yep. And um, Lionel, Ohio is a major oil refinery town. And um, Southern Ohio is major, major coal country. Major, major coal country. So these lobbyists pour pour and pour into the legislative influence. Thank you. That's real. I mean, it's brilliant. I believe you. Any other questions? So do you know about the Toledo uh, Sustainability Commission? Are they doing anything? Not right now. Because the person who was the head of it has got another job. And uh, I think they're... Pardon me? Meeting. Their last yeah. meeting was canceled. The last yeah. meeting was canceled. Yeah. It was about three months ago. Yeah, four months ago. Right. Yeah. So it, it's not, it's a group that needs a lot. I'm not sure how much impact. impact. Yeah, concrete results and plans coming out of that have been very none, yeah. non existent, yeah. practical. But it's a good, it's definitely a good organization of people that if you can have a little different direction can have a big impact. I think. Anybody else have a question? 
and you're like, where's the light switch? <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much. Thanks so much for coming out on this jury night. Appreciate it. I want to thank both of our speakers for giving us a whole lot of information um, and also what we can do about it. And each one of us has to, you know, make a commitment as to what we want to, you know, follow up on so that we can help the situation. Um, I, I wish we had a crystal ball that we could find out which is the best way to go, but you know, um, we just gotta keep chugging at it, and that's why we have these groups like you know ours. And and um, I remember seeing a thing on TV uh, that well, it was so I don't know where it was from. I don't know if it was a TED talk or whatever, but the man that was standing there, and he said, "There's a lot of hope in the organizations that are doing something for the environment." And on the screen behind him, which is about the size of this whole wall, it listed for 24 hours, rolling, 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 all the different organizations that he knows are that they are doing something for the environment. So we're just a min, little minuscule amount of people doing something, but there's people all over. So um, I, I thank them both for giving us some insights for having us kind of look up through our little Rolodex in our brains and in our, our hearts and to see what we can we can do. And that's, thank you very, very much. One more clap, huh? <laughs> Thanks, uh, this lecture is recorded on YouTube. So uh, if you missed something or other, I know we're having a little trouble with the, with the speaker for, for the people on Zoom. But um, hopefully they can, you know, pick up on that when they go to the recorded lecture. Our next lecture is going to be January 17th, and the flyers are over there. Sacred Pathways to Earth's Healing from Cosmic Grace and Guidance to Personal and Community Choices. Now, this is Sister Maureen Gardner. She is a, um, a sister from Halifax, Nova Scotia. But she lives now in, in um, uh, New Brunton, no. What's, uh, she lives out west. She lives in Canada. And uh, she uh, does this for retreat work, et cetera. So she is asking that this not be recorded. So if you're going to come to the lecture, that's as much as you're going to have because she uh, said that this is her life and uh, she didn't want to put it out there so that people wouldn't pay to do some retreat work. So she's kind of trying to, you know, save herself and her community. But you'll get this if you're a safe member. It'll come in the in, uh, mail, not now, probably because of Christmas and all that, but after that, we will have that. Um, is there anything else, John, that I need to mention? Okay, thank you all for coming. Be very careful going home.